The 2020 Google CTF had a challenge called Log Me In. The challenge description says log in to get the flag, and there's a link to a website and an attachment. Let's take a look at how I solved this challenge. Let's start by looking at the home page. My first thought when seeing this home page was of course to click the yellow flag button. Unfortunately, when I click on it, it tells me you must be logged in to access that. The profile page also tells me to log in. We can access the rather generic home and about pages without logging in, but they don't appear to be helpful right now. Clicking on log in allows us to log in, but there doesn't seem to be a way to create an account. We'll probably need to find a way to bypass this authentication check or determine a working username and password combination. I tried just entering in some common username password combinations, and admin admin unexpectedly actually worked. Unfortunately, when I clicked flag, it told me only Michelle's account has the flag. I then remember that this is the same Michelle name that's also listed as giving a testimonial as a premium customer on the about page. It looks like we're going to need to figure out how to log in as Michelle. Alas, my luck had run dry when it came to guessing Michelle's password. Next, let's take a look at what happens when we log in with the correct username and password in detail. The login page is just a simple HTML form. When the submit button is pressed, a post request is made to slash login with the username, password, and a CSRF or cross-site request forgery token. However, the CSRF token isn't actually set to anything and just ends up being an empty string. Interesting. In the HTTP response back from the server, we are redirected to the profile page slash me. However, two cookies are also set, session and session.seg. Session appears to just be Base64 encoded JSON. I was able to tell right away since it began with EY, which is how an opening double brace gets encoded with Base64, and JSON objects almost always start with an opening double brace. Decoding the JSON results in an object with three keys, CSRF, Username, and Flag. CSRF is a random UUID probably intended to prevent another website from making requests that the login user didn't intend to do. Username is the name of the logged in user, admin in this case. Flag is what's shown on the flag page. It appears that this can even be HTML, which isn't escape. And while we can change the session cookie, say change our username to Michelle, doing so will cause us to be logged out. This is because the session.sig cookie holds a signature for the session cookie. If we change the session cookie, then we'd have to sign it with the signing keys that appear to only be known to the server. If we try tampering with the session cookie, the server detects this tampering and ignores the invalid cookie. In fact, even if we could change the the session cookie and determine the correct signature, it wouldn't be much help. Since the flag is stored in the cookie that's generated when we log in, changing our username to Michelle after we log in wouldn't be much help since the flag would still be stored in the cookie. All we would be able to do is control what username and flag value is displayed, not know what the correct flag is. Next, let's take a look at the file that was attached to the challenge. You can see it's a .zip file that, when extracted, contains one file in it, app.js. This file was last modified on November 30th, 1979, according to the zip metadata. I didn't actually notice this modification date when doing the challenge. I only noticed it while writing the script. Perhaps it means something. It looks like zip files store time in a legacy DOS format, and all zeros in this legacy format equals November 30th, 1979. Nope. Anyways, let's take a look at app.js. It's a pretty simple Node.js server, written using the Express framework, and using MySQL as the backend database. This is the backend server we've been interacting with. We can see that there's a flag value, which is presumably changed to the actual flag on the CTF servers, and a target user is set to Michelle, which we learned about earlier. Neat! We can also see that the session cookie is signed and verified with the cookie session and cookie parser libraries. This code is probably okay, as the comment even says, don't even bother. Next, we see the body parser middleware is used to parse query strings. Express doesn't have support for parsing form bodies into objects built in, so you have to use the body parser middleware to do it. Interestingly, extended parsing is enabled. Extended parsing accidentally being enabled was the issue in another challenge past your eyes. When enabled, it uses the QS library to automatically parse query strings into objects. For example, A opening bracket B closing bracket C is parsed as an object with a key of AB and a value of C in normal mode, but in an extended mode, it's an object with a key of A and a value of another nested object containing the key B and the value C. 
Arrays can also be constructed with this extended syntax. Accidentally using extended mode can result in what code thinks is a string actually being an object or array, since JavaScript doesn't have any static variable types. Unlike languages like C, which enforce the type of a variable can't change, JavaScript allows variables to hold any type, and the type that a variable holds can even change at runtime. Next, we see how authentication is done. If request.session is set by the cookie session library, request.session will hold the signed cookie data. If there is signed data, it's stored in res.locals, where it can be used by a templating engine later on. This allows the username and flag to be inserted into the page at the right spot. Next, we see that files in the static directory are served as static files, and HTTP requests are redirected to HTTPS requests. After that, some middleware is defined, but not yet used. These functions can be used by some upcoming routes to perform additional logic on some pages. CSRF validates that the CSRF token provided matches the ones stored in the cookies to prevent cross-site request forgery. No cache disables caching for a route. Finally, auth displays the you must be logged in to access that error message if the user isn't logged in. Finally, in the source file are various routes. None of these routes are interesting, except for the one that handles post requests to login. This is the code that handles login requests, so it would be great if we could trick it into logging us into Michelle's account. It takes the username and password from the post body, creates a MySQL database connection, and constructs an SQL query to check the users table for users matching the provided username and password. If a user is found, then it checks if the user has logged in as the target user, Michelle. If so, it sets the flag in the user session to the actual flag. Otherwise, it just sets it to HTML, saying that only Michelle's account has the flag. It then redirects to the profile page. Let's take a closer look at this login handling code. When I saw that the username and password were being used directly from the body object there, I remembered that extended parsing was enabled. Perhaps we could exploit this by making the username or password an object or array instead of the string that's probably expected here. Let's log out and open up the Firefox dev tools. I'm switching to the Network tab and logging in with Admin Admin. I can right-click the request and click Edit and Reset to modify the data that gets sent along the request quite easily. This feature is pretty neat. I can edit the request URL, headers, and body. I can change the username string to an object and see what happens when I send the request. It looks like this results in an error message saying, Unknown error, 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 bad field error. Unknown column ABC and WHERE clause. It looks like we were able to inject ABC into the SQL query unescaped, but can we abuse this to log in as an arbitrary user? Well, let's take a look at what exactly is going on with the database access in app.js. The server is using the MySQL library to escape the query, so let's see what that library does. I read through the README for the library and noticed a few things. The documentation says you can use question mark characters as placeholders for values you would like to have escaped. It also notes that it isn't using prepared statements, which the library doesn't support. While prepared statements are implemented by the database and result in replacement of the question mark with the corresponding text securely, this library is just transforming the raw SQL and sending that modified SQL to the database. This has the benefit of supporting some additional features here that we can take advantage of. The library has several interesting ways that values are modified before being inserted into the SQL. It says that strings are safely escaped, but we can also pass in arrays and objects. Arrays are converted into the syntax for SQL lists or group lists if they're nested. Objects with a toSQL string function will have that function called and their return value inserted into the output SQL. And objects without a toSQL string function will result in each key value pair being transformed into the key, followed by an equal sign, followed by the escaped value. This is probably intended to allow usage where the keys were controlled by the programmer and the values by the user, but we can control both the keys and the values. At this point, I installed the MySQL and QS library locally and started playing around with various inputs so I could see how my strings were parsed by QS and how MySQL escaped the various objects. I quickly noticed that MySQL didn't just insert the raw table name when passed an object, but instead always wrapped it in backticks. While SQL only requires backticks when a table name has special characters, this library always adds backticks. After some tests, abusing arrays didn't seem too promising. I was able to get invalid SQL, but I wanted SQL that always resulted in the first row being Michelle, since that's what the login code checks for. 
It also didn't seem possible to abuse two sequel string being called, since it's ignored if it's not a function, and QS never returned functions in its output. However, using a normal object seemed promising. After some experimentation, I found that an object with the key of password generated SQL that contained password equals password equals XYZ for the password check. This triple comparison is actually valid SQL that will never match a row. Password equals password is evaluated first and always resolves to true, since all passwords are equal to themselves. True is then compared to XYZ and is never equal, since XYZ isn't a Boolean value. Next, after playing around with various values of XYZ, I found that setting it to 1 caused the expression to always match. The string 1 gets automatically converted into the Boolean true when compared, which means that it will always be a match. I went to the request page and edited the sent request again in DevTools. In the request body, I kept the username equals Michelle, but changed password to password password equals 1. I decoded the set cookie header and the response, and there was the flag. Overall, this was a pretty fun challenge to do. Thanks for watching.